here? Yes. So you're telling me if I just look here, I'll see a magic painting that moves? That's right. Did Mushu put you up to this? <laughs> no, I swear. Okay. Oh, my mother. It is magic. Well, I suppose if guardian spirits are real and travelers from the future are, this isn't that crazy. Only a son could wield chi. Wait, what did he say? What did he say about chi? You know what would be helpful? A net. Did these magical painters think I'm a goddess? Is she a goddess? They're incredible warriors. You've already made many great sacrifices. Mama's really outspoken here. Good for her. That's it? That was a really emotional moment. Pivotal. It was a pivotal, defining moment in my life. I'd have thought the magic painters would have wanted to convey that. No? The greatest challenge during training and all I needed to do was just do it? Oh, that's actually the Nike slogan. What's Nike? Does this Shang like men and women? Actually, that's really nice if he fell in love with me even when he thought I was a man. Like, love is beyond our physical forms. The chi is powerful, Huajue. Why do you hide it? That's, that's not what chi is! No, don't, don't chase him alone! How did I get lost? That's actually a little offensive. I have a great sense of direction. Why would I take off my armor in the middle of a battle? I thought they were incredible warriors, but not a single one noticed me getting behind them. I would rather be executed. What? No, 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 no. I can't see my family if I'm dead. This Shan Yu is really patient. Do I like men and women? Ah, yeah, Baba's sword. Well, I guess if I didn't care about Baba's armor, then why would I care about his weapon? This me really likes the emperor. So, what did you think? I, I have no words. That's never happened to me before. Wait. I've got an idea. Hello fellow humans, my name's Tara. I am a Korean Canadian writer and cosplayer, and I'll be honest with you. For a long time, I was biased against live action remakes, even though I've actually tried my own hand at it. Hypocrisy. And this strong dislike started young. When I was 12 years old, like so many others my age at the time, Harry Potter was a big part of my life. I'll never forget how excited I was to watch the live action movie in the theater, nor how disappointed I was with the result. I do remember blurting out in the theater in a not so quiet voice. That's not what happened. Where I had to stop watching HBO's Game of Thrones for the sake of everyone, because I became insufferable to watch that show around, even to myself. But they made Jamie a rapist and Danny weirdly sexual. I mean, it's important to realize that women enjoy sex as much as men do, uh, which was a concept unheard of even 50 years ago. But they made her, like, creepy. Take off your clothes. 
This was supposed to be a moment of intense vulnerability and love. Also, I don't give a shit about Tommen or Marjorie. Arya was perfection. Tywin was perfection. Joffrey was perfection. Tyrion was perfection until they made him a fucking idiot. We're in a crypt. Nobody thought of that. He's bringing all the dead people back to life and they put the women and children in a crypt with all the dead people. So, fra. Okay, back to Mulan. Truth be told, I had no intention of watching the live action remake of Mulan. But the reason wasn't my prejudice against live action adaptations. The reason was that I jumped on the boycott bandwagon after Crystal Liu, or Leo Yifei, a naturalized American citizen, condemned the pro-democracy protests in support of the police in Hong Kong, the latter of which was in turn criticized by the UN for using anti-riot tactics prohibited by international norms and standards. A boycott which doubled down after Disney's end credits acknowledgement of eight government entities in Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, where re-education camps have been extrajudicially holding over a million Uyghur people. So, why did I end up watching Mulan 2020? Because the original animated Mulan was a deeply, if not revolutionary, feminist film. And after hearing from a video essay by Accented Cinema, how they fucked it up, I have to see it for myself. Is it still a boycott if I didn't pay? And now that I have seen it with my own eyes, I must say, they didn't fuck it up. They shat all over it and smeared that shit around. Even if they did attempt to do calligraphy, it doesn't change the fact that the ink they used was diarrhea. Okay, so maybe this movie upset me. But I'll explain why this movie matters so much at the end of this video. But first, let's address the most popular criticism of the live action remake, that the new Mulan is a Mary Sue. A character so competent and flawless that they seem out of place even in their fictional setting. And I don't believe there's anything inherently wrong with Mary Sue characters, in the same way that there's nothing wrong with superhero characters, which are prevalent throughout popular culture. The prophecy states that you are the most important, most talented, most interesting, and most extraordinary person in the universe. Yes, Ray is a Mary Sue. And James Bond is also a Mary Sue. And that's just fine. But usually there's some sort of context like the force. Life creates it, makes it grow. Its energy surrounds us and binds us. Okay, so the description actually sounds really close to that of qi or ki in Chinese culture, I think. Except you can't wield qi. Qi is that which nourishes us and the vital fluids which flow through us, like air, or as Shiran J. Chow compares it in her video, blood. You can't wield blood. Unless Hama taught you how to blood bend in order to exact revenge on your enemies and their country people. But even if we accept the lack of legitimate explanation, even if we accept that the ancient constant of chi is treated in this movie like the fucking force, the chosen one narrative in the live action remake fundamentally changes the moral of Mulan's story. So let's revisit. Well, there was a lot going on, a lot of different messages in the original animated Mulan. Strength comes in different forms, women and men are equal, masculinity and femininity aren't mutually exclusive, and of course, Disney's recurring life lessons, believe in yourself, or be yourself. Wait, what's the difference? But if I had to summarize the moral of Mulan 1998, it would be this. It doesn't matter who we are or who society expects us to be. We are all capable of greatness if we accept ourselves and one another, if we work together. And this last part is crucial for Mulan. She was an extraordinary individual who accomplished an extraordinary feat, but she cooperated with and depended on her comrades. There was trust and teamwork, except technically when Qian Po was around. 
but the live action remake is so focused on making her special and physically strong that this balance between individuality and camaraderie is lost. And Mulan is portrayed as not equal to, but better than men. She's braver than any man here. Listen to me, all of you. We will live. I guarantee it. Because I will protect you. Also, it was pretty hilarious that almost immediately after making this claim, she just watches as soldiers get taken down one by one. Pew pew pew. Pew pew pew. The only time there's anything remotely close to teamwork is when everyone else works together as a team to let her and her alone save the emperor. Alone. You need to find the emperor. We'll hold them back. And she still got saved by the romantic interest. <sighs> I honestly don't know what this movie was trying to do. I think this obsession with making Mulan such a physically strong and special chosen one stems from wanting to raise her up to make her successful. But this choice fundamentally undermines Mulan's character. Again, a large part of the original movie is that strength can be found in different forms, that we all have something to offer in teamwork. And what Mulan brought to the table was her intelligence, her cunning, her strategic mind, all the synonyms, which is replaced in the live action remake with aggression and recklessness. Instead of reflecting uh, and coming up with solutions, the remade Mulan bulldozes her way through problems, blindly chasing a chicken as opposed to thinking of a clever way to get chores done, running after the enemy alone with no plan, only to somehow get fucking lost. And this new aggressive, reckless characteristic may have been instilled to be the opposite of traditional femininity, which has historically been synonymous with passivity, which is, you know, only natural when half the human race has had their mobility restricted for centuries. Legally, economically, politically, and physically. But the consequence is that what gets distorted isn't just Mulan's character, but also the original film's unique feminist message. I don't know about you. But what made the animated film so relatable for me was that Mulan kind of sucks at being a woman in the way that society demands of her. But while she fell short of those external expectations, she still accepted her own definition of femininity, even if she carried out stereotypical notions of masculinity. Just because I look like a man doesn't mean I have to smell like one. I wasn't aware that hygiene was a gender thing. When's the last time I watched this cosplay? It has to be hand washed. Otherwise it literally rips apart in the machine. And fuck that. I am a lazy Gudetama. But Mulan also sucks at expressing masculinity in the way that society traditionally expects of men. Break it down. And work it. The point is that she never fully conformed to any strict gender rules. And that is the single most badass revolutionary feminist shit right there that by not limiting ourselves to rigid gender presentations, we have more room to grow. Take a look at Yao, a character who at the start of the movie is the embodiment of hypermasculinity, unable to express his emotions aside from anger and perceiving femininity as an insult. I am Yao, king of the rock, and there's nothing you girls can do about it. And who by the end, is able to fight in a dress and openly shed tears of joy. Being strong doesn't have to mean forfeiting or rejecting femininity. Though, to be fair, if tears are classified as feminine as per the traditional gendering of emotions, the new Mulan does cry quite a bit. But, and maybe I'm just being a cynical asshole now, a lot of the tears in the remake seemed mawkish, like the writers were trying to force sentimentality. <laughs> But the greatest way in which the remake 
distorts the original with its obsession with success is with Mulan's core. The fundamental traits that drive Mulan, her motivations, are compassion. I would have squashed that cricket so fast. Sorry, Cricky. And critical thinking. And I know we already talked about her mental strength, but I think it goes beyond intelligence. Mulan doesn't blindly nor fully conform to society's norms, which is what makes her stand apart. She instead questions and ultimately rejects axiomatic truths. So you'll die for honor. What is the punishment assigned to this imposter? Expulsion. I would rather be executed. <laughs> In the original, Mulan fights to save her father. And as Accented Cinema points out, she saves the emperor because she sees him as a fellow human. In the remake, she fights in order to serve the emperor, the ultimate symbol of the patriarchal status quo. I know my place. And it is my duty to fight for the kingdom and protect the emperor. I'm sure that the remake just wanted to make Mulan strong and capable and special. But in the end, it trades in her compassion for reckless individualism and her inquisitiveness for deference to the patriarchy. I know the intentions were there, similar to the intentions behind the concept of girl power, which I'll post a video essay on in the future. And this well-intentioned, yet ultimately misguided display, the signaling of feminism, is best captured by the character of Captain Lee Shang, or rather, his absence. Captain Lee Shang was split into two characters, because the creators didn't want to depict romance with someone in a superior position in a post-Me Too world. As producer Jason Reed explained, I think particularly in the time of the Me Too movement, having a commanding officer that is also the sexual love interest was very uncomfortable. And I do appreciate the sentiment. Abuses of power and sexual harassment have pervaded too many industries and societies and have harmed too many lives. But Captain Lee Shea never did anything inappropriate or even remotely romantic until Mulan is back home. Not only when she leaves the army, but is back in her home. You know, after the power dynamic was removed. Unless you consider... You fight good. ...to be romantic. Which I do in general. Just not during what should have been a cathartic farewell. Yes, there was physical attraction. But not from the top down. Theirs was a relationship based on mutual respect, trust, and most importantly compassion. Oh my god, look at Shane's face. But yeah, let's alter this compelling interrelationship because what lies on the surface is clearly more important than that which lies beneath. Actually, no. The Huns are more important than Snow. And I think that is what bothers me the most about Mulan 2020. And what makes this movie so important to discuss? It exemplifies a pervasive pattern of focusing on surface over depth of missing the forest for the trees. And yes, symbolism is important, but it's not enough. It's not enough to change the name of a pancake mix brand while ignoring the racially motivated war on drugs and subsequent mass incarceration. It's not enough for multinational corporations to signal support with rainbow colored products and floats while doing nothing to further or protect LGBTQ rights or worse, actively supporting institutions that harm members of the community. And it's not enough to say that a film is feminist because it has a physically strong protagonist who doesn't end up with her former boss while sending the message that only select women matter. And while making movies obviously can't hold a candle to reforming entire criminal justice systems and advancing human rights, our media, which has tremendous power in shaping our collective imagination on how we view one another and ourselves, is worth deeper reflection. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to hit like and subscribe. If you'd like to see more of my cosplay, you can check out my Instagram. 
And if you'd like to hang out with me in real time, you can join me on Twitch, where I live stream every Monday and Wednesday night. There's a lot of learning and research and nerding out in general. Oh, shit! Please stay safe physically, mentally, and emotionally. And Happy New Year. Fuck 2020 so hard. One minute. You know what? I'm just in case. I'm gonna also put a countdown here. Oh! Oh my god! Happy New Year! <laughs> if you are looking for a New Year countdown event in the middle of Tokyo, <laughs> head over to the Shibuka. God damn, beer is delicious.